Welcome, dear friend. It is good to be here with you today. Today in the Christian tradition is Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is called Ash Wednesday usually because, uh, and you may have seen folks like this if you're watching on Ash Wednesday, folks with uh, ashes imposed on their forehead, uh, often in the sign of a cross. So you'll see the black or smudge on a forehead and that is simply a symbolic way of reminding us the beginning of Ash uh, of the season of Lent, 40 days before Easter, a season to prepare our hearts and minds uh, to reflect on our own mortality, to, uh, to try to uh, be open to uh, practicing things in ways to prepare our hearts to really receive the promise of resurrection. Now, it's much easier to speak about that and to say that than it is to do it. Uh, I, uh, so I invite you, as we begin this time together, to do, first of all, something that ritualizes this time together. I want to light this candle as a reminder to you and to me that this time we've chosen to be together right now is already sacred space. God is already here between us. No matter what time it is you're watching, if you're watching live, if you're watching later, whenever it is, uh, God is here with us. That sacred presence never, ever leaves us. And the candle is just a reminder of that sacred presence as we're here together. Uh, so this space between us is sacred. It's an opportunity for us to reflect together, to be together, to be thankful for our presence together. I set this right here, where you might see it on the corner of your screen. So traditionally, we gather on Ash Wednesday in person. Um, however, we've discovered that, you know, our uh, folks, for the most part, are folks online who watch and experience Ash Wednesday. And as the number of people who even come for an in-person Ash Wednesday opportunity, has declined, it seemed appropriate to mark the beginning of Lent in a way that is more accessible to the largest uh, group of us. So as we gather in this space uh, and as we think together, I thought I'd begin with a simple reading. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard Rohr wrote this delightful little book, uh, uh, Just This. In it, he wrote what he considered to be practical and important for every one of us to note. And his writing, this writing is very, uh, very crucial to understanding uh, what Richard tells us uh, as a way of living. Uh, but it is dying before we die. Anyone who wants to save his life must lose it. Anyone who loses her life will find it. This is from Matthew. 1625. This passage is a very strong, almost brutal statement from Jesus. It has perhaps been discussed, dismissed, misunderstood, disagreed with more than almost any of his radical teachings. I believe that Jesus says this in such a strong and absolute way because he knows that the human ego fixes upon roles, titles, status symbols, and concocted self-images. And he wants us to know that these are passing creations of our own minds and culture. They are not, in that sense, objectively real. All of them must die if we want to be real, and they do not die easily because we have mistaken them for elements of our real self for most of our life. It is the tragic case of mistaken identity. The real is that to which all the world religions were pointing when they spoke of heaven, nirvana, bliss, eternity, or enlightenment. Our only mistake was that most Christians delayed these inner states until after death. This distorted and delayed the whole spiritual journey. When we die before we die, we are surrendering to the real now, the union with God now and therefore later too. The human ego wants two things. It wants to be separate and it wants to be superior. This is why Jesus says this self, 
the one that wants to be superior, the one that wants to be separate must die for something much better to be found. I think Richard invites us into what I hope is the central theme of what lies ahead for us in this 40 days of Lent. If you count carefully, you'll see that Sundays are excluded from the count between now and Easter. Uh, but 40 days of Lent is an opportunity for you to practice, for me to practice, for us to imagine for just a moment that indeed these lives we have received are a gift and they're also finite. We do a lot of things in our society, in our world, to avoid recognizing how temporal each of us is. Uh, we uh, tend to warehouse older people in institutions somewhere far away from us. Um, people as they age often color their hair to disguise the fact that they are aging. Uh, we do all sorts of, take various supplements and other kinds of things with the hope of prolonging our physical existence such as it is. Uh, I remember a line that has stuck with me ever since I saw uh, the epic movie, adventure movie, um, historical, mostly probably fiction, but something true called Braveheart. Uh, in it, the lead character, William Wallace, uh, when faced with his own death and uh, people wanting him to avoid uh, facing his own death, he said, everyone dies. Not everyone truly lives. Indeed, everyone does die. But we do lots of little dances to put that out of mind. And uh, there are lots of questions about what it means to prolong our lives. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have modeled for me uh, in, in both of my parents who uh, uh, have a great deal of longevity. Dad is 95, mom is 89. Yes, they, they've been around for a while and they've modeled what it means to live a good life, to engage with life for as long as they can and in ways that they can. And they still engage me in wonderful conversations that are a true blessing to me. And that kind of fullness of life is worth continuing to go on. And yet I've had conversations with people too. I remember uh, early in my days at St. James, I was visiting with a, a resident at one of the local nursing homes and she was 105. And um, she was then bedridden and couldn't get up and move around. And she wondered what the purpose of living was her going on. She was ready from her perspective to die to face death. And I do think that what Lent offers us is the opportunity to reflect on the meaning of our lives. Uh, because our lives are finite. This came up for me, this idea of impermanence, when I was watching Snowfall just yesterday. Uh, now, it, the ground had been warm overnight. Uh, the temperature outside was 37. So those little snowflakes, and they were actually not little, they were big, wet snowflakes fell. And as I watched them through my window, they were beautiful and then they hit the ground and re-entered the, melted and re-entered the water cycle um, uh, as that. But for a moment, there they were being the purest snowflake they could be. Um, and that glorified God just by being a snowflake for, without questioning the end. I'm not saying you shouldn't question the end. We don't know what death brings, what's on the far side. We have hopes as people who follow Christ. But what challenges us is uh, the fear of walking, uh, of going through that door. I don't want you to rush going through that door. I'm not encouraging that. What I am saying is, what would it look like if we died before we died? If we let go of all the illusions of what gave our lives meaning, you know, titles, uh, uh, you know, our economic gains, our salaries say how much we are worth. Uh, the accumulation of things say how much we are worth. We imagine that those say how much we are worth. And yet 
they don't go with us. They're over. They're done. And as such, they leave so much to be uh, desired. But what if we learned to die to those things and to the illusion that they are what give us meaning? And I think Lent invites us to do that. So here's one of the things I could invite you to do. I'm inviting myself to do each day or as many days as you can. Uh, set a plan. Light a candle, perhaps as a recognition that your life is sacred, that this moment is sacred, that your time with God is sacred and reflect on this one beautiful life you've been given. What do you want to do with it? However much of it's left and none of us know, quite frankly, whether you're um, in your 90s, your 80s, your 60s, or some other number somewhere along that way, we know, none of us know how long our lives will be. So what will we do with the life that we have? How will we live it in such a way that it really is living? Um, and how will we not live fearfully of what is ultimately to come for every one of us? Now, it might seem morbid to you to reflect on your uh, limitedness, but as a fact, if you can accept that and then live into the life that you do have, recognizing now that if death is a reality, so is this moment of life you have, this heartbeat, this breath. It's a gift. What will you do with the gift that comes to you? So reflect on your mortality. Um Think about how valuable your life is. I am totally serious when I say to you, and I'm hoping one day I will believe it for myself as well fully. When I say to you, you are infinitely precious and unconditionally loved for the gift you already are. I am saying to you that your life is worth living, but you don't have forever to wait to do the things that your life is meant to do. So if you reflect for just a moment on what a gift it is to be alive, that this breath, this heartbeat is a gift, this moment is sacred, then it's an opportunity for you to say, I don't have forever to give this life away, at least in this form. And while I am physically in this form and have the opportunity to be who I am meant to be, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it wholeheartedly. Periodically, uh, doing what our Buddhist si siblings would do, reflecting on our impermanence, that we don't go on forever, at least as we are right now, is an opportunity also to reflect on what we'll do with what we have. Um, it may seem limited, certainly not as limited as that sweet uh, group of snowflakes, one by one that passed by my window before they melted into nothingness but certainly not as long a life as, say, our star, the sun. Uh, somewhere, you know, in between those two is the length of our lives. And we can appreciate every breath and every moment alive, but part of that is recognizing what is real, what really matters, and how we can live this life that really matters in a loving way towards everyone we encounter recognizing that just as we are precious and loved, so are they. Um, so as you prepare your heart for Lent, perhaps set a practice like lighting a candle and sitting and reflecting on what you're going to do with this gift of your life. And instead of just reflecting on it for 40 days, reflect and engage, put it to action, make a difference in someone's life. Whatever way that you choose to, that you feel called to, make a difference in someone else's life. A kind word, you, you, you'd be surprised. So reflect on your impermanence. Another thing that often people do in this season is to give up something, a form of fasting. And maybe that's a practice you like to take up. I know people who have over this 40 day period given up you know, their favorite beverage or have given up uh, their favorite food, sweets or something like that. And each time that we long for or yearn for that thing that we have given up is an opportunity for us to once again be thankful for the gift of the life that we do have. 
whether we have that cookie that we love or that drink that we love or whatever it is that we love, we do have this life that we have been given. So whatever practice you choose in this season, um, maybe you just take up the general rules of the United Methodist Church. Uh, because I happen to be United Methodist, I know, first rule, do no harm. Just imagine if you let this season uh, be an opportunity for you to do no harm. You'd have to question all the things that you do and think and say, do they create harm? And in what way do they create harm? And how do you avoid doing them? So first, do no harm. Second, do all the good you can. Uh, once again, that comes can come out of a reflection on your own impermanence about your finite gift that you have to give away to make a difference. Will you do it? Will you do it? Do all the good you can. And the final one is to find the practices to give meaning to your relationship with God. Perhaps you take up a meditation practice. Perhaps you light a candle and sit quietly. Perhaps you read a book of the Bible, one verse at a time, one chapter at a time. Perhaps you take this time to reflect in some other way. Maybe you commit yourself to praying for the world every single day. Though you do not see what it does, you perhaps know that it does do something. These are all possibilities. Here we are entering the Lenten season. I will be preaching during all six Sundays of Lent, a series that's uh, I've entitled the series Healing Journeys, Embracing Grief and Presence. We'll talk about the reality of grief in our lives, the kind of um, common grief we feel uh, about having lost things that we imagine to be true in a golden age that's we only hold in memory now. Um, the way that we can't seem to speak civilly to people that we used to be able to, that we can't have conversations, that the world is filled with lots of violence happening in places like uh, Gaza and Ukraine and uh, South Sudan and uh, the Tigray region still of um, Ethiopia and uh, Somalia uh, and Burkina Faso, Nigeria. Um, and our list could just go on. And there is a collective sense of grief and pain and heaviness we carry. So we will talk about how we carry that. That's our first uh, embracing our shared grief is our first um, sermon. Uh, and then we'll begin to talk about how to be present in the world for God, how we can practice presence in ways that bring us into the moment more for each person. If you choose to join us, that's great. Hopefully this Ash Wednesday, which also happens to be Valentine's Day as well, will be a day filled with opportunities to reflect and to love and to show that love to the world and perhaps to significant people in your life, if that's what you choose to do. In any case, may you find peace and joy. May you be embraced and encircled by God's love on this day. May you have sobering thoughts about your own mortality and may that instead of paralyzing you with fear, open you up to give the best you can give in the moment you have to give it. Uh, Go in God's grace and peace. And until we, you see me, I see you, we see each other again, may you feel the eternal presence that is always with you. As we end this time, recognizing that our sacred time together is over, we extinguish this candle. Remembering God is always present and sacred and this space between us has been just the same. Go in peace.